Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Larry Kim with Simplify Asset Management, and I'm joined by my handsome colleague, Harley Bassman, managing partner and portfolio manager here at Simplify. Today, we're going to dive into our mortgage-backed securities fund, uh, Simplify MBS ETF, ticker symbol MTBA. The fund was launched on November 6th, 2023, just a few months ago, and has already grown to $340 million in assets. So that's the fastest growth we've had of any of the Simplify ETFs. So there's obviously some investor interest in this topic. Uh, so we'll dive in just to let you know that the chat is disabled. So if you have a question, please on the bottom of your screen, click on the Q&A link. Uh, and as a reminder, this webinar is for informational purposes only and is not to be construed as investment advice. Okay, so uh, Harley, before we dive into today's topic, uh, the Simplify MBS ETF, you spent much of your career on uh, mortgage-backed security desks. So can you give us a little primer or background on mortgage-backed securities? I mean, putting today's interest rate environment aside for the moment, um, why mortgage-backed securities? I mean, presumably, if an investor wanted the highest degree of, of quality, uh, they would buy a treasury. And if they wanted a higher yield, they might buy a, a corporate. So what's the case for mortgage backs? Thank you, Larry. Good afternoon. Hello, all. Um, so mortgages are the uh, second largest asset class after treasuries, uh, bigger than munis, bigger than corporates. Um, a mortgage bond is actually rather simple, although civilians like non-institutional people rarely ever see them. Um, so what happens is um, thousands of mortgages, regular home loans to regular people are bundled together, stamped by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or Ginnie Mae, which means they are guaranteed by the government. And they're put into these bundles and then sold and then put into the market as these giant billion dollar pools. So when you buy a piece of a mortgage security, you're buying a small section of thousands and thousands of loans. These loans from Fannie, Freddie, and, uh, Fannie and Freddie are, are prime loans. Prime means a FICO higher than 720. So when you heard subprime back you know, 10, 20 years ago, all subprime means is 719 or lower on the FICO score. And most of you know what a FICO score is now. Um, unclear how clever it actually is anymore because of various reasons, but nonetheless, that's how it's done. For all intents and purposes, a Fannie, Freddie, or Ginny mortgage-backed security is bulletproof, zero credit risk. I suppose Fannie could go under, but if you think that's a possibility, my advice is to go and buy a gun, a can of tuna, and small denomination gold coins because it will be the end of civilization. It's so, not so technically, the government guarantee, there's no explicit government guarantee but you just can't imagine a scenario where the government would would let uh, these products fail. Ginny May are actually explicit full faith and credit. Right. Fannie and Freddie are not. The reason why is really political because if they actually guaranteed it, all that that debt would have to go onto the government's balance sheet and then be posted as you know uh, debt de deficit it would increase our. Our, our leverage ratios, which are meaningless, frankly, because we could print our own currency. But that's why they don't do it. Uh, it it's really a it's a technical reason. It will never happen. And, and anyways, most mortgages are are pretty solid. Anyways, there aren't that many defaults that go through uh, the regular you know prime mortgage borrowers. The defaults really happen with subprime people. Um, but more to your question, why do you buy a mortgage bond? Um, you buy a mortgage bond because you get a higher yield without any credit risk. Now, there is a trade-off. The trade-off is this. The homeowner takes out a 30-year loan. The homeowner has an option to refinance, to pay off the loan early and take out a new loan. This is very unique. You only have this happening in the US and in Denmark. Everywhere else in the world, 
loans are either five years or they're floaters or something else. You don't see 30 year fixed rate loans available um, anywhere else. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's a free option, it's zero cost. Um, some of you may be familiar with other commercial loans. They have prepayment options, but they cost money. This is a free prepayment option. So you, the mortgage security buyer, you're short the option of the homeowner. What does that mean functionally? What it means is this, from the homeowner standpoint, he has a 5% loan. Let's just say he has a 6% loan, so closer to reality right now. If rates go to 4%, he will pay his loan off, take out a new loan at 4%. If rates go to 8%, he's going nowhere. He's holding that loan. This, by the way, as an aside, is why the housing market is totally jammed up and why you aren't seeing house prices come down despite the fact that house prices have gone up and rates have gone up, making it the least affordable market in 20 or 30 years. The reason why is 72% of homeowners have 3.5% or lower mortgages. They're not moving anywhere. They are trapped in their homes. Because if they moved and bought a new house, they'd be taking out a 6% loan, which would cost a lot, lot more for the same dollar value house. So that's why there's, there's no sellers because they're, they, they're trapped in their homes. Is that so a good it, thing? It, unclear. In the scenario you mentioned where, um, where mortgage rates went down to 4%, and a whole bunch of homeowners decided to refinance um, and you own that mortgage bond, What? how does it affect the bond? What happens? Yeah, you're, you're a step ahead of me, man. The homeowner side, if rates go to eight, he stays in the loan. If rates go to four, he gets out of the loan. Now you're the mortgage security buyer. You're the other side of the trade. So you've bought a 6% mortgage bond. If rates go to eight, that loan's not prepaid, and you're in that 6% bond in an 8% world. So you're sad. You're earning 6 You could be earning 8 but your money's locked up for 30 years. You're sad. If rates go to 4%, you'd think you'd be happy because you have a 6% a bond, but the homeowner refinances, so he calls your bond away from you, and you lose your 6% bond. You now have cash, and you will then reinvest at 4%. So you, the mortgage buyer, are short the option, and you're always sad. Rates go up, you're stuck in this thing for 30 years. Rates go down, you have a one, two, three, four year security. So this is why mortgage-backed securities trade for a higher yield than treasuries. You have no credit risk, you have no credit risk, but you're always on the wrong side of the trade. So what this means functionally is that if you own a mortgage security at, at par at 100 at a 6% rate, if rates go to 8%, well, your bond might be worth 85 and you're sad. If rates go to 4%, the bond does not go to 115. It gets called away from you at like 104 and you're out of it. So it can go up by two, three, four points. It can go down by 20 points. So you're on the wrong side of that trade. You are short convexity. Remember, convexity is uh, unbalanced uh, returns. If you make a point, lose a point, zero convexity. Make two, lose one, positive convexity. Lose three, make two, negative convexity. So you will now want a higher yield, offset the risk, the negative convexity of being a security that can go up, up four and down 20. So the question is, how much is that worth? This is why we hired all these physics PhDs in the 90s was to go figure it out. And what you do is you go and build an option model, looking at all the possible scenarios. And it's more than just interest rates. It's the economy, faster economy. People get different jobs and they move. Um, cold winter, people die, I suppose, and they got to go sell their houses. More divorces, sell your house. So all these things will drive prepayments. It's primarily interest rates, but it's a lot of other stuff also. And we model this up. We figure out what is the fair value. I will tell you, the fair value, the average spread has been about three quarters of a point. So if a 10 years trading at four, mortgage bonds generally trade at 475, generally. What you have right now is if a 4% treasury, it's a 5.5% bond. I think we have a chart showing this. 
um, layer uh, that shows yeah. the spread of mortgage bonds over treasuries going back on the uh, 20 or 30 years, whatever, whatever chart I did. There we go. So you can see the average is around 75 between, between the 0.5 and the 1. And that's just blown to smithereens. You saw that we had the big blowout during COVID. And if the chart went further back, you'd see that um, you had the same kind of blowout in 08, 09, and the same kind of blowout in um, uh, 87, 88, uh, with the last time you had these big volatile moves in the market. Um, so right now at one, uh, 150 over, it, it's, it's kind of nutty. Uh, we could talk about why that is in a second, but big picture, big picture is you can go and buy mortgage securities now, mortgage bonds that are the new bonds, the ones trading near 100, so bonds with a five and a half, six percent coupon, then about a point and a half over treasuries um, with no credit risk. Um, that's that's a that's a pretty fancy uh, notion right there. Um, and so we created a product that allows you to buy only, only these newer issued mortgage securities. All right, we'll we'll get there in a second. But coming back to this chart, this dramatic increase in spreads, um, presumably that's because when mortgage rates were 3% or less, you know, there's not much incentive to uh, prepay a mortgage, but uh, with mortgage rates now 6% or higher, that risk of prepayments is greater in the future. And so therefore investors demand that higher yield. Is that why spreads have widened? No. That was a good guess, though. Um, there's a component of that. You're totally wrong. There's a component to that. But what's really happening here is you can model a mortgage bond to look like a buy right, where you buy a 10-year treasury and then sell a three-year call option against it. That's what it kind of looks like. Now, to be clear, there is no option trading in MTBA. I'm not trading any options at all. I just buy unlevered mortgage securities, but it looks like a buy right. So the question is, if the 10 years, the 10 year, right, it is what it is. All that matters is the value of that call option that you're selling against it, the theoretical model option. The bigger the option, the wider the spread. Smaller the option, the tighter the spread. What will drive this? The number, the number one primary thing is going to be implied volatility. When implied vol goes up, the, the move index goes up, the value of the option goes up, and the spread would widen. Vol goes down, same thing. So we have the move index now at you know 110, 120, which is much higher than this long-term average and almost double what it was before COVID, um, when it was trading at like 60. That's reason number one. Reason number two, it's kind of tricky. You can go to my last commentary and read about this. It has to do with the yield curve. I'm not going to discuss that right now. I will just tell you as a statement of fact that when the yield curve inverts, the yield curve inverts, the, 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 the value of the option gets bigger. Those two things in combination, high volatility and an inverted yield curve makes this option very fluffy. And that's why you've seen the spread wide from 75 to 150. Two things will bring that spread back in. One, obviously, balls come down. Two is the yield curve steepens. Those two things will likely go hand in glove because when the Fed finally starts cutting, and when that's going to happen, that's debatable. But when it starts cutting, you'll see ball come down. Balls are high right now because we don't know when they're going to cut. People, the market was pricing in Fed cuts for, for January and February a few months ago. Now we're out to like June. I think it's going to be July or August, but we don't know. That uncertainty is measured in implied vol, and that's why balls are still high in interest rates, because we don't know when the Fed's going to start cutting. Once we know that, uncertainty will decline and balls will decline. And those two factors of vol coming down and the curve steepening will make mortgage bond prices go up relative to treasury. So if treasuries go down by a point, we're going to go down by a half. 
Treasury is up by a point, mortgage go up by, by, by two points. That's kind of what's going to happen. It's not that mortgages won't move. They'll just move better versus treasuries as this spread from 150 comes on in to 75. Okay. So that makes mortgages relatively attractive right now. Relatively. Um, relatively. relatively. Okay. Uh, and by the way, for our audience, Harley Mench, uh referenced the uh, volatility of fixed income, uh, the move index, which is essentially the VIX for fixed income. Um, and Harley was the actual creator of that index uh, earlier in his career. So I still um, had hair. When he, when he had hair. Um, okay. So uh, how about, um, what about corporates? Um, it seems to be that despite the fact that it seems like every economist on the planet has been forecasting recession for the past two years, you would expect that to be uh, a trigger for investment grade corporate spreads to widen, but it doesn't look like uh, that's been the case. So let me go back to our, our chart here. So what are you seeing here, Harley? Okay. We could go into a long discussion, you know, uh, Mike Green, my partner and I, uh, to talk about corporate bond spreads. So that's the blue line. That's the spread of an investment grade IG, so triple B or better credit security. That's spread over treasuries. Um, it averages about 65. Right now it's about 55. It goes up and down for reasons. Larry is talking about this notion that theoretically with an inverted curve that's predicting a recession, so spreads should be widening, blah, 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 blah. Is that true? I don't care, okay? What I'm going to toy is this, is that the mortgage spread is vastly wider than the credit spread. That's the takeaway here, is that and you these spreads usually go hand in hand once again, there are reasons why. I'm not going to talk about that now. But this spread for mortgages is vastly wider than for credit. And, 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 and um, this, once again, is the relative value concept for taking on any kind of risk more than... There's three risks you could take. You could own overnight cash in one-day treasuries, right? There's no more... That is a zero-risk asset. You can go out in time for maturity, that's duration. You can go out for credit risk, right? Or you can take convexity risk. What's happening here is you're taking on this convexity risk of a bond can go up by five points, down by 20 points. That risk is it gives you a vastly better return than credit right now. So what you should be doing is if you own equities and you don't want bonds, don't talk to me. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not selling to you. If you own some bonds in your portfolio, then you should probably have them distributed between treasuries, corporates, mortgages, munis, a variety, high yield. That's reasonable. What I'm telling you right now is if you own bonds in your portfolio, you should be going and selling some of the credit bonds and allocating more to the mortgage bonds. As a matter of fact, you should probably be selling some of the treasury bonds and buying some more of the mortgage bonds. What I'm saying is you should be over allocating to mortgage securities and the mortgage securities you should be allocating to, I'm jumping ahead over here, is bonds, newly issued mortgage bonds, not old mortgage bonds. Now, I'll let Larry get to that in a second. Uh, okay, so let's, let's move there right now then. So essentially the the key feature of MTBA is you're not replicating the mortgage backed securities index uh instead you're buying the newer mortgage backed securities so just take us back a little bit and kind of explain uh why newer is better um it's not that newer is better per se. I mean, I guess new bonds were fine three years ago when they were Fannie threes. Um, they were new bonds at the time. The problem is now is that the mortgage index 
is 72% Fannie one and a half to three and a half. It looks like a Fannie three. If you want to go say the mortgage index now, you could model that up as a Fannie three. And you can easily see this. Go look at um, MBB. That's the big uh, mortgage index ETF, 26 billion. Go take its coupon and divide that by its price. It's paying like a, I don't know, three, one, three, two, three, three, you know, dividend to it um, because the average coupon is about 3.2. Um, uh, that's because most of the index is old mortgage bonds that were issued when the Fed was doing QE. Rates have gone up and these new Fannie five, five and and sixes, these are the bonds that have been issued in the last year. What we're doing is allowing civilians, non-professionals, to really isolate buying, let's call Penny five and a halfs. MTBA looks most like a Penny. It owns three coupons, but it's very close to being as a pure Penny five and a half right now. And you can see what's, what's happening is your yield um, is basically uh, 80 points higher. Your distribution yield is... You, you have my chart there, Larry. Your distribution yeah. yield is 200, 200 basis points higher. That's the coupon you're getting, but the duration is a lot shorter. The duration is shorter because this bond could be called very quickly because it's near par, right? Fannie threes are trading prices like 84. They're, they're never going to be called. Um, it's, it, it, it's a trade. I mean, if you, if you think the rates are going down back to, if you think 10 year rates at three and a quarter right now are going to 3% in a couple of months, don't buy MTBA, okay? It, it's, it, it, it has no has, has very little duration. Do the rates are going to stay plus or minus 50 around here or go higher? You should be selling MBB and buying MTBA. Do the rates are going to be staying somewhere around here? You know, and I'm not saying exactly, but plus or minus 50 or so, you should be selling credit bonds and allocating more to MTBA. You're basically going into a buy right type strategy. That's the profile of what it looks like. And as you know, people do buy rights when they think a stock is going to stay somewhere around where it is right now. So, uh, and it's strictly a function of how close the option is to being called. Fannie Five Fs now are trading at a price of about 98 and change. The strike price on them is probably close to 103, 104. Because you don't, you don't refinance when you get exactly, you have to get in the money. So you're basically, you're long, let's say you're long a, a treasury at par and you're short a call stuck at 105. A Fannie 3, it's as if the treasury is trading at 85 and the call is at 105. You're like way out of the money. The call option gives you almost no value. The option is worth very little. As I said, remember, the value of a mortgage security is that treasury less that call option. And for Fannie 3, the call option is very small because you're so far out of the money. That's why it yields less and has a longer duration. Um, That's a concept most investors are not familiar with because I've had people ask me, you know, how is it possible, you know, two treasuries with different coupons will still have the same yield to maturity, right? Uh, but it's, it's very different in the world of uh, mortgage backs. Well, you are exactly right, and it's a tough concept to handle, but here's the answer. Treasuries are not callable. The government is not going to buy the bonds back. Therefore, they can go to a price of 150, 160, 170. And that's why they tend to have the, treasur the treasuries of the same maturity tend to have very close to the same yield. It's a little different for, for other reasons, but basically they have the same yield. In mortgage bonds, it's different because mortgages can be called. Corporate bond with similar maturities will have similar yields. Once again, usually corporate bonds are not callable. Now, muni bonds are callable, by the way, but let's not talk muni bonds. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that uh, at another time. Yeah. Um, but one thing is if um, you said that the fund is primarily centered around the 5.5% coupon area, uh, but there are mortgage-backed securities with 7% coupons out there now. So why not go even even higher? Well, that's pretty easy. 
let's pretend IBM stock is trading at 100. Um, you can go and sell the call struck at 100, call struck at 105, call struck at 110, call struck at 120. You can do a lot of things and you'll get more or less money for that option you sell it. Um, when you buy, if you buy a Fannie 7, it's almost like selling a call struck at 99, where it's probably going to be called, you know, eventually. That's what's happening when you get these higher coupon mortgages. What we're doing by trying to center the average cost, sorry, average average price of the portfolio, somewhere around 98, 99, is to give the portfolio some duration, but not a lot. So as a duration of, let's say, three and a half, four, kind of like a five-year note, whereas the mortgage index is closer to a 10-year duration. Is that good or bad? Your market view. I mean, if you think rates are really going to go down hard, you want duration. So yeah, go and buy lower coupon bonds. If you think rates are going to stay somewhere around here, then you should go and sell. So it's the same thing. IBM, when you sell a 105 call, the 110 call. It's your market view. You take in more money when you sell the 105 call. Um, is this portfolio active? That's where you're going to go to next. The answer is yes and no. I don't take speculation. I don't try and swing for the fences. I try and maintain a portfolio somewhere around 98, 99, 100, somewhere in there, somewhere in the, in the sweet spot of mortgages. Um, I don't want to have a portfolio at 101. That's just because the portfolio will have very little duration. It will have a very high yield. But I just don't, I, I just don't think that's, I think people that buy mortgages, buy bonds, are looking for some bit of duration, some bit of protection against rates going down because of bad things happening in the equity market. They want some, you know, move there. If they want no duration, they should buy T-bills and not buy this. So I'm trying to give them this middle ground of a, of a medium duration with a very high coupon, kind of the, kind of the sweet spot best of both worlds. Uh, I, and I, for the record, I'll tell you this. Mortgage bonds near par are the best risk return bond asset in the market right now, period. I didn't say best of all time because, you know, if rates go down, I want to buy a long duration asset. But when you PV, risk return, everything together, option value, the whole thing, our mortgage bonds right now, near par mortgage bonds, are the best risk return of the market. At 150 over the curve, it's just, I mean, you're talking 90 over, over, over corporates. It's just playing the wrong price. Why is the wrong price? Once again, that's a little more complicated question, but you're not taking any credit risk, man, and you're yeah. getting 150 over the curve. Like, I've done dumber trades than that. Um, right. Will this come back? Yes. Um, you're going to, because... For a variety of reasons, um, you know, one of them right now is the Fed's basically selling forty billion a month, right? They're they're doing QT, they're letting the Treasury and the and the mortgage portfolios, uh, you know, uh, bleed out. Um, Treasury and Treasury, they're, they are what they are. Mortgage bonds, it's a different animal. So when you're basically, you know, selling, you know, twenty thirty billion a month, that's effectively what they're doing. You know, uh, that that there, there's pressure on these things that will ease up too eventually. Right. Well, let, let's get into the, the holdings a little bit. So uh, the fund is buying, getting exposure to these Fannie Mae bonds, but not directly. So the fund invests via TBAs. So give us a little background. What exactly is a TBA and why is this the vehicle of choice rather than going out and buying the actual Fannie Mae bonds? Okay, back at the ranch, civilians don't own mortgage bonds. So, I mean, high net worth might, okay? And civilians might buy um, like some mortgage index fund, um, but really civilians don't buy mortgage bonds for a lot of reasons. Um, they're kind of complicated. They're complicated because anyone of you who owns a house or a condo and you have a mortgage, you're paying, let's say, two thousand a month, you know, uh, three thousand a month for your loan, and you're paying that same number, three thousand a month, every month for thirty years. If you look at your statement you get every month, it says three thousand a month, but in the beginning it's going to be like twenty eight hundred for interest, 
and 200 for principals. Time goes by, it goes like this. So, you know, a year, two or three long, it's 2,000 for interest and 1,000 for principal. That's because it's an amortizing security. The bond will go to zero at the end of the day. Now, a treasury bond is not, right? You buy a treasury, you buy for, for $10,000, you get coupon every month or six months. And at the end of the day, they give you back all the money. Mortgages give you the money back over time. If you buy an actual mortgage security, you're going to get some principal back every month. Well, that's dirty business. Two reasons why. One, you have to reinvest that money every month, which is expensive because you're only getting a little principal back, but you got to reinvest it. And re reinvesting small amounts of money is bothersome. So you probably don't reinvest it for two or three or six months. It sits in your account earning nothing. And then you go and buy it. So that's, that's just dirty. Number two is there's a taxable event. If you buy a mortgage bond anywhere but par, so you buy it at 98, every month when you get principal back, you're getting back 100 par. You're making a small two-point profit every month on a little bit of money. When you get your 1099 in the beginning of the year, in February, for instance, you'll get 1099. What's going to happen if you want a mortgage bond is come March or April, they're going to send you a 1099 supplemental where they figure out the capital gain or loss from the principal you're getting back. You're not going to want that. Your account's not going to, it's just dirty. So what happens is um, most mortgage bond trading by professionals, insurance companies, pension funds, um, the big mutual funds, they trade in what's called TBA, to be announced. It's basically a one month mortgage futures contract. Remember, a futures contract and a forward are exactly identical, except the futures contract is listed on an exchange and a forward is not, it's over the counter, it's principal to principal. They're identical. All I'm doing is buying a one month mortgage futures contract and I buy it for March, and then come the come the uh, come the uh, you know the end of the month, I sell March and by April. Next month I sell April and buy and buy uh, and buy May. The dollar price difference between the two months is basically the mathematical value of one month's interest um, and prepayment and everything else. So uh, you're always rolling these contracts, what, just a few days before expiration? Or how does that work? Uh, kind of complicated, but basically, yes, before expiration. There, there, there's a whole delivery process because some people actually do take, if you don't roll it, you get the mortgage bonds, um, which is, a, it's a, once again, a very dirty business. It's only done by professionals, um, but you get them. And, and, and um, you don't want them, as I said. Uh, so... 90% or more, 95% of all mortgage trading is done in TBAs. And TBAs, they're more liquid than treasuries. you got like, you know, 500 billion Fannie Fives. How big is the tenure? 40 billion? I mean, mortgage, the mortgage market is, is actually more liquid than the treasury market, just for the sheer size of it. Okay, because that was uh, one of the questions we got uh, from one of the attendees was wondering about the volumes. Uh, I guess I, it, that's it's easier to no buy. conceivable issue. Right? It's easier to buy 100 Fannie Fives than 100 tenure notes. So, yeah, okay. Uh, so we have time for some some questions now. Um, so, one of the questions we got is if you can dive a little bit more into the issue of this of the negative convexity and this convexity risk. Um, how does that, how does that play in terms of like market risk? I mean, what is the, what's the, the downside of, of having this negative convexity? Big picture, stand back. The forest is you are long a 10 year note at a hundred initially and short of call stock at 105. That's it. Goes above 105, bond is called, get all your cash back. That's not how it works in mortgage land because mortgages are not like an efficient market. Each homeowner is going to go refinance when he wants 
and each homeowner faces a different hurdle. If, if, if a guy's having, he has a newborn child and rates go down, is he going to go to the bank and refinance? No, he's taking care of his kid. So this could be quite a while before, before he does it. Um, someone, uh, uh, if you have, it costs, let's say, um, a thousand dollars to uh, I'm making up a number, thousand dollars for an appraisal uh, to, re to do a refinance. If you have a hundred thousand dollar loan, a thousand dollars is a lot of money to spend for an appraisal. If you have a two million dollar home, a thousand bucks is nothing. So the size of the loan will drive prepayments. If you are in California or New York, you have a mortgage tax. Well, you don't want to refinance. It costs more to refinance because you have a mortgage tax. If you're in Iowa, uh, you have smaller homes. If you're in Arkansas, you have a slower economy. You don't move as often. So it's very difficult. It's an inefficient option. We could model it as a 105 strike, but you could see mortgage bonds trading at 108, 109. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a whole entire business called the specified pool market, where we trade bonds, mortgage bonds from California versus Texas versus Iowa. We trade mortgage bonds that have an average loan of 100,000 versus 400,000. All these things together. TPAs are basically all of them combined. Um, and, and, and so that's it's tricky. So we hired all these quants in the 90s to go try to model up and figure out what it's worth. There's an inexact science to when they'll prepay. But the big idea is you ain't seen a mortgage bond at 120, okay? They're going to cap out around you know, 105, 106, 107 uh, in, in, in a best case scenario. And they could, I mean, there are fanny one and a half, so the trade down to 75. Okay, uh, when, when rates were up 5%. So these bonds can go down a lot more than they go up. So remember, convexity means non-linear payout for equal outcomes. So rates up or down by 100. If I don't make five points, lose five points, make 10, lose 10, it's convex. If I make two, lose one, possibly convex. Lose three, make two, that will be convex. Um, and so all we can do is just once again look at the look at the forest. The average value of this negative convexity is three quarters of a point. That's the long term profile, and now it's trading at double that level. That's good enough for you to go and say this is the wrong price. I'm getting paid more than I should for the ordinary risk of the market. There's no credit risk here. Now that's tricky. Because credit risk, I mean, we look at junk bonds when they widen out, maybe that's a bad thing. I mean, we all know that when we see a stock or a closed-end fund or something, where all of a sudden the yield is much higher than everyone expects, that's usually a signal there's going to be a dividend cut. The markets kind of know these things. Mortgage bonds, there's no credit risk. There's no dividend cut. The coupon's fixed. Maturity's kind of known. Well, the, the final maturity is known. What is unknown is when you get your money back in a year or two or in seven, eight, nine years. That's what you don't know. So speaking of the unknowns, uh, one of the questions wants to know about what you consider the, the worst case scenario. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on whether you're looking at absolute or relative performance, right? I mean, if rates come down a lot, you're going to wish you owned a longer duration fund, right? But what, what is your worst case scenario? It is strictly relative opportunity cost. You're not losing money. These are not chunk bonds. They're not going to default. You will get your money back, okay? Um, what's going to happen is um, if rates drop, if, 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 if Russia goes and drops a nuke in, 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 in uh, Ukraine tomorrow or China invades you know, Taiwan, then you're going to go and see you know, 10-year rates might go from four and a quarter to two percent in a day. Fine, and, you know mortgage bonds will go up by you know four, five, six points. Treasuries up by twenty points. So did I lose? Well, I made eight points. I don't feel that bad about it. But yeah, if I owned a ten year, I would have made twenty points. So it's an opportunity, a relative value. But you're not losing money. You're not placing a bet on something where the price is going to go to zero or fall down, fall to bed. It's strictly a relative value idea. Um, and uh, uh, 
I mean, and if you're pick, if you look at the that at the pickup in yield, um, very quickly you're going to go and cover most of your problems. Um, if, if, if rates stay here for a year and then and then you know rally, you've kind of made enough coupon to cover that 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 that, that um, opportunity loss. So it's all opportunity um, over there. Okay. Uh, another question about TBAs has come in. Um, are they strictly offered on the 30 year or are there such thing as TBAs on the, on the 15 year? 15 years are very big. Uh, it's a huge market, uh, as is 20 year and 10 year. And there's also, TB there's also stuff uh, on arms, the trade, any of the main, uh, mortgage issuers, Fannie, Freddie, Ginny, uh, offer lots of mortgage securities. Um, some of them are, are less liquid than others. Um, but they, they all trade, uh, they trade all of them, but 30 years are the benchmark. They're by far the biggest. I see a question here about primary versus secondary. The pri You've heard those words primary and secondary, but I think you're confusing them over here. The primary market is the homeowner to the mortgage lender. So Quicken Loans, you go to Quicken, you take out a loan from them, they make the loan, they bundle them up, they go to Fannie Mae. They give Fannie Mae like 10,000 loans. Fannie Mae looks at them, takes a few loans and throws them out. As long as they meet the Fannie Mae qualifications, 720 FICO, blah, 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 blah. They then take this, they stamp it with their name. They put a pool number on it, a QCIP number, and give it back to Quicken. Quicken then goes, takes that loan, and sells it to Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, or J.P. Morgan. When it goes to J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, that's the secondary market. When it's from the homeowner to Quicken, that's the primary market. When you look at a mortgage bond, so a Fannie 6, the 6% 6 coupon is the secondary coupon. That's the coupon of the mortgage security of the TBA. If you look under the hood, you'll see like a 6.75 gross WAC, gross weighted average coupon. That's the loan to the to the homeowner. So the homeowner took a 675 loan. It goes to Quicken. That's 75 basis points. That money gets spread around. It goes to the servicer. It goes to Fannie and Freddie. It goes to the insurance company. It goes to all these various people to go and process. <laughs> Remember, the homeowner is making the payment to somebody who then makes payment to someone who goes to someone and then goes to you, the bondholder. You got to pay each of those people along the way. If the homeowner defaults, Fannie Mae has to go and make everyone whole. Well, they get paid an insurance fee for that. So there's all these people in between. Usually that is about a 75 basis point spread in there. Right now it's closer to 95 for various reasons. Um, it was as small as 50, 55 basis points uh, uh, during like 04, 05, 06. The 75 is the general number uh, that you'll see. Um, and and, and that, that's the primary market. So it's a primary rate and a secondary rate. When you see a rate in the newspaper saying homeowners are paying this rate, that's the primary rate. When you see the mortgages are trading this yield, that's the secondary rate. So a little tricky, but you know it kind of makes sense. Think of it as the wholesale price and the retail price. Okay. Uh, thanks, Harley. Um, I think we answered most of these questions. Um, some of the questions are are obviously asking about your views on on rate cuts and market expectations. I can um, we we can't really talk about that. Um, Jesus Christ! If I, if I can name tickers, I can name my view. Okay, well, go ahead then. Let's, let's go there. This is why you really want to go and buy MTBA. Okay, this is the real reason. As I said, that spread is driven by the option price. The option price is a function of implied ball and the yield curve. When the Fed starts cutting, that option price is going to come on in. What I think is going to happen is this. If you look at the forever old man gray beard averages, you have an inflation number. The Fed's saying 2%. You have the real rate that is usually 50 basis points. And if you go look at the Fed, what have they said on their dots prediction? 
They've said in the very out years, 2027 on further out, 2.6. Uh, how about that? 2% target, 50 cent on top of that. 260 is their long-term projected Fed funds rate. Fed funds in the two-year, 50 basis points, 3%. Two-year to the 10-year, the 100 basis points. These are the long-term forever averages. What's going to happen is this. The Fed's going to cut someday. Not as soon as Mike Green thinks, but they're going to cut someday. They're going to yank that rate on down in the course of a couple of years, down to 2.5%. The two-year's going to go to 3%. The 10 year right now, four and a quarter, it's going nowhere, man. And the 30 year rate is going to go up, steepen the curve back out again for all for various uncertainties. As we rotate this curve around the 10 year point, you're going to see mortgage prices go up. Par mortgage prices go up. Fannie five and a half are going to go up in price as the option value comes down. Fannie threes, they're not moving. Their price off the back end of the curve, which I've already told you, is not moving. And Fannie Threes, that option value is already very small. It can't get much smaller. If you believe the Fed's going to start cutting rates come July, August, they're going to do it in a moderate fashion. So, so it's a slow grind kind of steepening the curve. And then we're going to go back to our long-term average rates. You want to own these par mortgage bonds and not the mortgage index which index is Fannie 3, they are not going up because there's no option value in them. If you own MBB and you believe what I'm talking about, you should be selling that and buying MTBA. If you think we're going to go into a hard recession and the Fed cutting rates you know, overnight by 200 bips, you should probably stay in MBB or you should go and buy 10-year treasury, something like that. Uh, that's my view of the world. It, it, it's not like I'm making some grand prediction this is a gigantic regression to the mean concept over the next two or three years. I just don't see the 10-year going much below 4%, 375, 350, whatever, okay? It ain't going back to one and a half. Over the longer term, 10-year rate tends to be somewhere near nominal GDP, not real, nominal. If the Fed's targeting a two inflation, and we're looking at a long-term real growth of two, two and a half. You're talking about a four, four and a half nominal GDP. Ten years there right now. I mean, what is nominal right now? Nominal last month was, what was it, eight? Right, we had a five and a half, five and a quarter real and a three CPI. We had eight nominal. Tens are not, you know, a great value and an eight nominal. Now, you're going to see that the Atlanta Fed now is what, 3.2, 3.3, inflation two and a half, threes. Okay, we're talking about a five and a half, six nominal. I don't think tens are, are a great value at four and a quarter if I got nominal at six. Now, could nominal collapse? Could we go to a recession where, where, where uh, GDP goes to one? Yeah. Could inflation go to two? Yeah. Well, now you're talking nominal at three, and tens can come down a lot. Do I see that happening anytime soon? No, because of demographics, which is a different topic entirely. But, you know, I believe the demographic story is going to support service sector wages, and that will support inflation and the economy. It seems like um, the the case for owning these newer mortgage bonds is, is self-evident. But why do you think that... Uh, this fund is all alone. Um, why aren't there a lot of other funds doing this, do you think? So, number one, I'm totally shocked that we're the first ones to bring this fund. It's it's crazy town. I mean, all the big boys, Gunlock and Bros and, and Blackrock, they're all talking about how mortgage bonds are the cheapest asset out there. I, I didn't invent that story, okay? Anyone could read the chart and knows that 150 over, it's the wrong price. Question is, why didn't you know, PIMCO or, or Gunlock or somebody else bring a fund like this. The reason why is the same reason I had to go and scratch and claw to get this thing done. Is everyone says to me, well, how is it going to perform versus the index? Well, the answer is it's not. The index is a Fannie 3 with a duration of seven and change. I'm bringing a fund with a, with a, with a coupon of, of five and a half and duration of three and a half, four. It's entirely, it's, I'm, I'm not trying to go and match the index. 
everyone wants the index. People love the index because they're, they, they can't get fired. You have job security if you own the index. Whenever you go off index, all of a sudden, you have career risk. That's going on right now, is the people don't want career risk. They're, they're, that's why everyone goes to passive now. You can't get fired for passive, can you? The market's the market. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to pass them. Going to MTBA does require you to go and basically say, I'm going off index. I'm going to go basically a little shorter in duration than the mortgage index. If you think your job or career is at risk if you do that, then you know what? Stay at MBB. If you want to go and be, if you want to go and make some money, likely, likely outperform. I'm promising likely um, you buy MTBA. So I'm not saying to go and sell everything and buy this. I'm saying that if you have some MBB, you sell some and go into this. If you have some IG credit, sell some of that. If you have some 10-year duration, five-year duration treasury, sell them all of it. Sell some, go into this product here. Um, and, and I think kind of that kind of overweighting, not everything in one basket, overweighting it in the general thing, I think you. I think if you do that, you probably get to keep your job and make some more money. How, how about going forward? Uh, so one of the questions is: um, right now, you're predominantly owning some five, five and a half, six. In the future, you mentioned you like owning mortgage bonds that are trading at about ninety-eight. Is that going to be kind of the deciding factor going forward of which bonds you buy? So what I do is. Um, I try to keep, I mean, look, you can do it right. Look, look at our screen every day, man. We have how many bonds I own. I have fives, fives and sixes, add them up, weight it out. You get an average price. The average price now is about 98 and a quarter, 98 and a half. Somewhere in there is the average price of the portfolio. I'm very comfortable with that. If um if rates went, you know, up a lot, I'd sell some fives and buy five and a half. I go up in coupon to try and maintain that dollar price. Rates go down, I'll go down in coupon. Try to maintain that. I try to not do it a lot. I try to really kind of drag my feet because each time I do it, there's a bid offer involved. There's costs. I don't want to do that. You know, I, I, I trade this like it's my own money. Um, now, the question you want to ask is this. If rates went down really hard, let's call it but slowly, not tomorrow, but over the next three years, rates went back down again. And I slowly started moving the portfolio to stay at 98. If it came to pass, the Fannie threes were trading at 98, then MTBA and MBB would be basically identical, right? Because then they'd be a par and I'd be a par and that'd be it. So I will go, I mean, I could end up in that. Do I think we're gonna ever see Fannie threes a par again? Not likely, but if they did, I would end up at that level. And would there be a value add for MBB versus MTBA? No, there wouldn't be. As a matter of fact, I guess they'd be better because they're what? Five basis points and worth 15 basis points. So they'd be a little better. Okay. Um, Harley, is there anything that we didn't talk about or that we didn't get to that you want to make sure we hit? I, I, th I think, you know, for people who, you've just got to be cognizant of the risks you're taking, of how you win, how you lose, or how you perform better or perform worse. Um, and, and um, Get comfortable with that profile. I'm not offering you a free lunch. I'm not saying that there's magic money here. There's not. I'm just saying that um, these bonds here are extraordinarily valuable, cheap versus other securities out there, um, and especially versus the mortgage index. It's tough to, if you're in TLT, 20 year treasury. Getting you to sell TLT with a duration of 14 and buy me with a duration of four, I I'm not going to go and try to convince you of that. You know, um, if you own MBB or some other, more any other mortgage product, I, I don't know of any other fund out there that's like mine. I think every other fund out there of consequence tracks the treasury, the mortgage index. If you own anything in the mortgage index, you should be moving some of that into this. All of it? I guess if you're bearish for the market, sure. But I mean, some of it. The other thing is this. If you have a view on credit, because so far I basically made the story of Fannie threes to Fannie five and a half is basically like a duration trade-off from a seven and change to a three and change. You could make the case 
with the curb inverted. And Mike Green will give you an incredible story about how that, that brick wall is right in front of us. Um, and credit is very expensive. Um, if you buy into the story, the credit is too tight right now at 55 over, and that we're going to have a real problem in the economy next year when we hit the maturity wall of refinancing all the, the average credit corporate bond is five years. Those bonds were all taken out 2020 to 2022. So I plus five is 2025 to 27. All of you on this call, I'm sure you can go to internet and look up the maturity wall of refinancing. You're probably going to want to go and, and look at that and say, I should be getting out of credit. That's a good story, looking at, 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 the, at, at the tightness of spread, as well as the shape of the yield curve, kind of anticipating a recession. Um, you'd want to go sell credit to buy mortgage, to buy convexity risk. So, so th those two stories are, are 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 very good. But if you own thirty year, if you, if you own you know fourteen duration, you're not going to buy my paper. Okay, well that's about it. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Harley, uh, today for this discussion. Uh, very helpful. Uh, want to remind the audience that uh, to keep up with our upcoming live events, just go to the Simplify homepage, uh, and you'll be able to register for our upcoming events. Um, we on March 14th, uh, we have our next uh, live Keeping It Simple webinar, so you can register for that. And with that, uh, thanks again, Harley, and uh, thank you everyone for your interest in the webinar.